I'm going to introduce our wonderful speakers. Uh, we don't often get a chance to do a lot of events with speakers from down under and the APAC region. So really happy to be able to open up some space today for a couple really great product people. First off, Alejandro Patterson, who's the principal product manager at Honey Insurance, where he's responsible for building experiences and integrations that turn insurance upside down. Oh, that's exciting. Passionate about improving startup success, he mentors at the Founders Institute and speaks regularly on validation, prototyping, and experimentation. And also we have with us today, Simon Hilton, who's the director of product at Carbon. Uh, he leads and grows product teams there with a focus on delighting customers. He's also a mentor at Blackford Ventures, where he helps startups with product strategy, design, and development. And he hosts Product Ops People podcast, where he interviews guests about their work in product management operations. And we've also had Simon at some of our prior events here at Product Board, so really excited to bring him back. So with that, I'm going to pass over to the two of you. Welcome, and thanks for joining us, and uh, let's get things started. Awesome. Thanks, Scott. <laughs> Thank you for taking the time to join us, everyone. I can see we've got a lot of people in the chat. We've got London, Scottsdale, Montreal, Houston, Dallas, a lot of different places. And hopefully we've got some people from Australia here as well. So welcome to Building the Strategy Bridge. Yes, my name's Simon and my partner Alejandro will be with you for the next 30 minutes, an hour or so, and then answering any questions about product strategy. But I think we'll start with where we, all, where we began here. Some people might already be in this current kind of state or have been in there before, but we were two product managers at a working in product at a fast growing startup. We had a lot of momentum behind us, but we had run into very frequent problem of being able to connect where we're going as business with what the product teams are working on. We found a lot of problems with our roadmaps being communicated and people being able to really understand them. We were really just shipping things and there was not really a good understanding of why we were doing it and where it was taking us. And we were working in silos. We had multiple teams across multiple products and there was just really no clarity of what direction we were going in. So there was one day when Ali joined the team, I remember it very fondly, when he was looking through our roadmaps and going, what are, these are great direct, these are great maps, but where are we going? And so he messaged me and said, look, can we talk about our roadmaps? And I was like, that's great, but we need to talk about strategy. And we both had a bit of a winky face slack at that point because we both understood, hey, roadmaps are great, but if you don't know what direction you're going, your map doesn't really matter. It doesn't matter if you've got the map of, as we talked about, Houston, if you're trying to find your way to Dallas. So we got together and we really worked through this problem, trying to understand the key problems of all the stakeholders, the executives, the product leaders, the product managers. And in a way that would be essential and clear that can be very usable and that was one of the problems that we faced as well a lot of the information that was out there was very high level but it wasn't very practical so we wanted to figure out something out that would help that so it really worked i mean it was really interesting how we built this out and we showed it to the stakeholders and they were kind of yeah i get it let's keep going in that direction so it worked for our teams so we were one day thinking okay so how can we actually make this something that we can share with everyone and help everyone get very practically up and running. So that's why we used it at that startup we're at. I use it currently within my organization. Ali's used it in his company right now, Honey Insurance. And we've actually shared it with other people around our community and they're getting great results as well. It's one of the first times some people say that they, they're having strategic conversations with all the people in the room because there's a nice little simple framework to have those conversations within. So we wanted to really share it with everyone and that's why we're here. So we went out also to talk with a whole bunch of product leaders, CEOs, PMs from, I think it was like 15, 20 interviews. We went out there and then talked to a whole bunch of people about what problems they were having. And it did seem to be that there was some really clear themes that popped up out of it. They were having trouble effectively communicating and all these kinds of things. But what we really found was there was some real important effects of not having a good written down product strategy, something where everyone can look at, everyone can make decisions around. The first was a lack of clarity and autonomy. The team said that they could draw a straight line between what they were doing and how it progressed the business goals. And that's what we saw in our original problem statement as well. So conversations on direct change were difficult and with a little concept on how it affects the business. You can tell me in the chat if you've ever been in a situation where it's, okay, so which way are we going and why are we going there? 
in your product teams? Should we be able to feature A, B, or C? We don't know. There's no way to really understand which way would be a better uh, direction. I think there's that old saying, which I'm going to butcher that any port is very favorable if you don't know where you want to go. That led to actually a flow on effect of a lack of executive confidence. So when the team didn't have a really strong way of saying, this is the direction you're going and this is why we're going there, often this led to a lot of situations where people would just fill those gaps. There was a lack of confidence in what the team could handle. And so it is told, okay, you just build this. And it became that feature factory kind of environment, which really wasn't useful and helpful in creating those positive product behaviors of discovery, really understanding the customer need, and then being able to build and prototype solutions towards that. And that led to really just a poor experience for everyone. Everyone who was going through this was like, I don't feel like this is somewhere that I'm doing my best work. The teams don't feel empowered. They don't feel like they're really enjoying coming to work and solving these problems every day. <clears throat> so that was obviously a bit of a problem, especially when if you pride yourself as an organization of hiring top performers, because a lot of top performers we interviewed would say, well, I just wouldn't stick around. And this is because those top performers wanted to make an impact. They wanted to know that, okay, the things I'm building, I'm happy to do the work. I roll my sleeves up and get things done. But is that actually going to move the business forward? Is it going to be good for my career and understand that we took this organization, this team, all these products from here and took it to there? So this framework and these conversations were really instrumental to retaining the right people, creating a great amount of confidence in your team and ultimately creating direction for your organization or for your teams to walk. So we wanted to create a strategy framework that was most important testable because if you're going to have conversations and disagreements, you at least want to be using data to make those, not opinion. Second, it would empower teams and provide confidence to the executives of the product direction. I think this was something that I think we were very mindful of is in some ways, product management can feel like, uh, I'm going to use my words here, but in some ways we feel like we should be given too much power. And, and I'll explain what I mean there. There's a lot of situations where people say, well, the product manager should be making the decision. And I say, I tend to come at it from a different point of view. You have to earn the right to make those decisions. And that's by providing confidence to the people who have made promises to your board, to your investors, to your partners where we're going and why we're doing it. So when you actually give them a good understanding and confidence that you're right, you're going in the right direction, you're making the right decisions and you're using the right data to do that, you get an immense amount of confidence, which they then say, I've literally been in this situation where I said, well, how can I help? Just keep going, do what you're doing. And it provides a really great environment for product behavior to thrive. So we talked about testability. So we, within this framework, we were really quite inspired by Gibson Biddle's strategy work which encourages the strategies to be testable units. So if you haven't seen his talk on this, it's really probably, I'd say, a must watch. But essentially, rather than having one monolithic strategy, you have strategies. And each one of these is a testable how we're going to win. So being able to actually, ahead of time, set that framework out and say, this is working, but this is not working. Let's just change this part rather than let's change the entire product direction is often a better way to have that conversation. Secondly, we talked about empowering teams. We really want to encourage those continuous discovery habits and help them explore opportunities that are really aligned with the strategy, but we may not know the answer to. And this is typically really important when you're using something like a Horizons framework. Typically, when you're coming out of a founder or scale-up kind of space, Horizon 1 was their original vision. But there's going to be other Horizons or changes, quite significant changes that make it more competitive in the market but the team needs to be able to navigate that and to do that they need to be able to do the proper activities of discovery and, and making trade-off decisions between going down this path or that path so being able to create the environment where those behaviors are encouraged and accountable is super important to being able to uh, navigate the direction of the product and finally confidence we think is super super important this connects various layers of the executive product leadership team and team direction, but at the end of the day, it's a coherent story. It's something that everyone understands and can get behind and just understands, yeah, got it, cool. It shouldn't be overly uh, complex and it shouldn't be overly jargon-filled, but it's got to be something that I can read and go, yeah, I get it. Let's move, let's do that. And with that, I will hand over to Ali. Awesome. Thank you, Simon. So we've just talked through the effects of good and bad strategy. It's been conceptual. 
We've talked about what it should look like. We've talked about like where we've drawn inspiration from. And I'm going to get into the nitty gritty. How do we actually go out when we haven't got a strong product strategy and actually collect the information, bring it together and make it functional for you as a product leader within your organization? Um, so the first thing I'm going to call out is that the work is the strategy. And what I mean by that is as you go through the process of collecting this information, you're having conversations, you're feeding back what you've learned to your team, your peers, and your executives in a way that throughout the journey, you're reflecting back what you're learning so that when you finally take the finished product and socialize it, everybody's already heard about it. They understand the language that you're speaking because you're reflecting back their language. And you can say with confidence, I've already spoken to, I've already worked with the teams. We have alignment. This is the direction that we want to go. And as Simon said before, the usual outcome of those conversations is how can I help? So the first thing is, is you already have a strategy, whether it's written down, whether it's in multiple pieces, whether it's just based on what you've delivered. When you're leaning into developing a product strategy, the first thing to understand is what has been done in the past already. And it could be how your product is showing up in the world. It could be the features that have shipped that are working versus not working. But as you go out and collect this information, I suggest you use a Miro or a Fig Jam board, go out and start just putting down all of your insights, speak to executive teams, get packs, pull together spreadsheets, et cetera, chuck it all on a Miro board and start grouping up all the different conversations that are relevant. Once you've completed that, once you've gone through and you're like, wow, okay, we've got some really clear buckets of things that we've done, then we can go out and go, okay, let's go get some qual. Let's go out and talk to customers and actually interact with them. And you can do that directly, or you can use your sales and marketing teams to collect the insights that are coming from the conversations that they're having. That then can be used to underpin the buckets. So it's like, here's what we've done. This is what the customers say that they want and what they're using our product for. And then the next step, of course, is use data. So we know that not always a customer are going to tell you things that aren't exactly what they're using it for, and it can be hard to understand. So the best thing to do is then underpin that with your product data. So collect the information from your product metrics, et cetera, have a look at your product analytics and marry that up to the groupings that you've got. When you bring all that together, you should have a clear picture of the, that your business has been going. And that gives you the platform to understand if we want to go to this next level, this next stage, this 12 to 18 months, what is it going to take to get there? And if we've already got stuff in flight on our roadmap, what things might have to come out or be changed for this to happen? And that's where you start having the conversations about the actual strategy, which is how are we going to allocate resources? What direction are we going? What features are we going to prioritize? And how are we going to make those decisions? How are we going to make those trade-off decisions? And how are we going to socialize them? And so let's go to the next slide. And I'm going to talk you through the framework we've put together. I just want to jump in for a minute. I think it's important to really underline this phase of the work, because essentially what we talked about was strategy is a direction. And when you actually look at what you've already built, that that's one direction. And then I'm not going to say one direction too many times. Trust me, I'm not going to make that problem. But when you talk to customers, they may have a very different idea of what you think the direction. And that was actually the problem in our case. And then we have the data. What's that all telling us? And essentially, you're just sitting there going, okay, this is what we built in the past. This is the direction we've been going. This is where people, customers think we should be going. Even then, from an executive or sales team, they may have a different view of this is where we think we're going. Do these things match at all? And that's where the strategy, the problems of strategy really come about is like, we all have different directions that we're going rather than having a single direction. And probably, and it's usually the case because you haven't had the right conversations to make the trade-off choices. And we've actually had people who've used this framework who this is where the value really hit. They wrote all this down. They sat down with their exec, with their CPO or their CTC or whoever they were working with. They're going, this is what, this is where we're going. Wait a minute. That's not right. That's what we've built. 
that's all the things, the direction we're going. And that's the direction the customers think we're going. And so it actually creates a very good conversation at the point to go, well, wait a minute, we're all not all on the same page. Let's all get on the same page and make sure that we're traveling and using our energy in the right way to go towards that destination. Another key place this comes up is if there's not a decent strategy in place, you'll often see sales teams selling to non-ideal customers. And I literally had this conversation a day or two ago where a CPO joined an organization and they had sold to a fairly significant big client, but it was taking their product in the wrong direction. So he had to have very significant conversations with those teams going, look, you're selling to the wrong people based upon the strategy of the CEO and everyone. We need to focus on these personalities. So when you, you can actually have quite effective conversations around how can we better streamline up and down the product development process and the sales process when you have something like this in place. Awesome. So this is the slide shareable version of the framework that we use. And Simon in a bit is going to talk through his favorite ways to present it. But we found this one's just really easy to, to present. So as you can see, there's three layers. The job of a product leader is really to align all of these areas. And I'm going to go through each of them in a second in more detail. But that's the bit that your role as a product leader is to get in, make sure that these things are clearly documented and understood and in plain English so that no matter who you're speaking to up and down the organization, it's clear for them how everything from what's happening at the product team level connects all the way up to the goals of the business and the company vision. So let's get into the next slide. All right. So I like to start at both ends of the spectrum, go to the top and go to your teams. <laughs> As I said before, in collecting this information, you're going to have to have a lot of conversations, starting with your teams, working out what they're working on, collecting all of that. That's critical. But even more so is understanding the vision and the goals of the people that you're working with, either parallel or above you. Understanding the vision and the interpretation of the vision, because sometimes you end up with these company visions, which are just like words on a page, and no one actually knows how to articulate what it is. That's a problem. That could be the first thing that you're digging into is as a business, we need to have a vision that can be articulated in a way that helps us make better decisions and set goals for our business. Let's say that's clear. Then it's understanding the goals that the business is going to be measured on, on each of the horizons, the next 12 months, three years, five years, 10 years. Those goals tend to be longer than your product strategy. So making sure that those are really clear and that you can actually see who's accountable for those helps you understand who the stakeholders are in your business that care about what you're working on. Another critical part of building a good strategy is understanding which person you're supporting in the business with those goals. And depending on the size of your business, that might just be the CEO or it might be a suite of executives that you're working with. I think something also to call out here is finding common language. Like I mentioned it a little bit before, but executives can have a very different language and product people have this tendency to use jargon that gives us our sense of community within a business. And we found when we were doing this research, that's a common challenge. There's actually a conflict at product leader and executive level in the type of language being used. And so looking to find the common language and becoming the translator is one of the key things to do when you're getting ready to build out your strategy. I'm just going to jump in at every point because I agree with what you're saying, Ali. But I think this is where you can typically lose people, though, when you present a strategy or a whole bunch of, hey, here's a bunch of features we're delivering. And the immediate thing uh, an executive thinking is, okay, so how does this push us further towards our goals that we set up with investors and to the board? And if you don't really even know what those were, it's very hard for you to create that narrative connection. So... I think one of his first things is to go talk to the CEO and say, what do you want? And show that empathy, showing what do you want? Where do you want to go? And really, even just asking those questions gives you a huge amount of trust that you're even thinking about those things when making product decisions. And sometimes they're not there. 
Sometimes, no, there are no goals. Sometimes there is no vision. We always advocate as we go through of these, you might find a gap in the whole structure, but it's better to do a first version than not have a version at all. As Ali said, yes, you might not have a company vision. Okay, let's just make one. Let's just to start out. But it doesn't have to be flowery. It doesn't have to be all singing, all dancing, because we can change it later. But let's start thinking about how we see this throughout the organization. So product leaders, what we see is your responsibility is the playing field, product strategies, the capabilities, and the measures. And I'm going to talk through how that all fits together. So the playing field is what market and customers must we prioritize. So in a software business, there's always going to be trade-off calls around features that you're building for specific subsets. Understanding the opportunity size, geographic location sometimes is important, and specific markets if you're B2B. What are you actually going after? And this is a collaborative effort. This is working with your sales team, your marketing team, and possibly your executive team to really set what the playing field is. And the idea here is that if you set that really well, your product strategies should look at the playing field, look at the business goals and say, I'm going to hit this business goal by playing on this field in this game using these product strategies. Underpinning the product strategies, which are like packets of work, is the best way that I think about it. It's like, this is a bet that we've got that's going to drive us in the right direction, which has work underneath it and is going to allow us to, to hit these goals. The capabilities that underpin this are either technical or people related. So what I mean by that is once you've got your product strategies, you'll have initiatives that sit underneath it. Those initiatives will require teams of people to deliver them and technical capability to deliver on those initiatives. So you need to be able to map your capabilities to the initiatives and the strategies. And that way you can start forming a picture around What's the people movements you might need to make in your organization? What does the shape of your teams need to look like? And where are we going to be putting an investment? Because we can say to hit this goal, we've got to implement these initiatives, which requires these capabilities. I think one of the key pieces here is having measures. So to make this whole framework testable, you need to be able to measure the success of each of the packets of work, initiatives or features. So if you're product strategy doesn't have a measure attached to it. So this is how we know this product strategy is successful or not. You're missing the point because how are you going to know whether that strategy is working for you or not? So it's taking the time to set the measures of success and make sure that they're understood across the business is really important. Simon, did you have anything to add? Yeah, I do. <laughs> Maybe some people are a fan of Shark Tank and they've seen how those pitches really roll out. They seem to be quite formulaic. And that's because you got to think in some ways like your executives are investing in you because they are. If for every decision a product manager makes, it's at least $100,000 up to millions of dollars of their investment when you put one product team behind it or several squads, whatever it is. So these are big investments to make. So you can actually think about it in that framework as well. Playing field is where you're going to play. Like where are you, what are you going after? Product strategy is how you're going to win. Capabilities, what are you going to need to get there? And that's one of the crucial questions that's often asked is, have you got the right team? Have you got the right tech? Do you have everything you need to actually win this game? And then how are we going to keep score measuring? So if you think about it in that way, I'm being very clear on, this is what I'm going after. This is how I'm going to win. And let's take maybe an example of product who's done a great job at this. So the playing field, product management software in North America, product strategies, great integrations, collaboration, and great UI. That's how we're going to win. Those are probably some things that product boards thought about in the past. Capabilities. We're going to need to have we see good relationships with our partners. Maybe there's some sort of data strategy involved, but these are all the things we're going to need to, uh, to really deliver upon that. And measures, obviously, that's where you say, how are we going to measure that the collaboration strategy is working? Okay, X many product managers and this many of their partners are actually viewing a roadmap board. So you can actually start to see when you start using this framework and apply it to products you may already use or even your own product, just start to see how these layers are starting to connect. Because when a, an executive sees a plan like this, which addresses the goals that they're going after, that's that point at which you get that question of, how can I help? I can see you've got it here. How can I help? Get out of the way, give you more funding, whatever it is. And I've literally been in several of these conversations, but that's exactly how it went. So we'll more about that later, but 
over to you, Ali. Awesome. So now to where the work gets done. And I've had many times as a product manager in large corporate, my team asking me, why are we doing this work? And I could usually say, well, this is the direction the business is going and we fit into that in this way. I found startups have always been a bit clearer around that. But really what we want to deliver as a product strategy should allow a product manager to easily have a conversation with their team and say, we're doing this work because it reaches this goal. And we're delivering on this opportunity because it moves the needle, even if it's a little, an increase in, in CAC by a percentage or whatever. So opportunities are bodies of work that customers find desirable. This feeds back into the continuous discovery piece, making sure that every piece of work that you're doing, unless it's a platform play, which then it would be under the platform strategy, actually aligns to value that's being shipped towards the goals of the organization. And how do you measure them? Reduction in CAC, increase in LTV, increases in CSAT, et cetera. There's many ways that you can measure that, but each of your opportunities should have measures against them. I think this is the space that most people are familiar with. If you don't have all the other layers, this is the feature factory. But when you do have all those layers, there are other positive behaviors going on. And we specifically call these opportunities because there should be a number of opportunities out there, different ways that you can, if you have created that space where the positive product behaviors can actually happen, you're not just being told, here's the solution, go build it. You're actually saying, there's all these things we could do, but you've got to be making those decisions based upon that impact that it actually makes. So that's why we're talking about what is this opportunity doing for you? Is it reducing CAC? Is it increasing LTV? And how are those actually mattering to someone who has those high level goals? Actually, we've gone all the way down the, the pyramid model. The decisions made here, actually, the results go all the way back up. So it's quite crucial to have good product teams at this point and being able to provide them with the right information, give them good decision-making frameworks with all of the supporting views from around the business, but then being able to see that information very quickly back into the rest of the business. So we typically, uh, as you can probably see, we've built this out in a number of different ways. It may look very simple, but it's actually quite telling when you actually try to fill in these boxes. And we have ways to do this in Miro. As I said, you can do it on slide deck. I'll get into my favorite in a minute. But essentially, one thing to realize is that you may go through this entire framework here. We may go through this entire framework and you might find just big holes and that's okay. That's actually part of the process. I literally had this conversation with one of our friends who was using this framework and he did the whole thing and there were just big holes. And he goes to CEO, did you know that we don't have a competitive analysis? We've never done one. And the CEO said, really? Maybe we should do that sometime. So it does actually start to shine light on areas which which may need a little attention to create that same direction we talked about before. Another way that appeared was when he had these conversations to say, as we talked about, talk to your customers, also talk to your internal stakeholders as well. He found out that what the customers thought was going to be built in the next six months and what the sales team thought was going to be built in the next six months were completely different. And again, when he brought it up as a CEO, say, hey, did you know that we all are not on the same page of what's coming out in the next six to 12 months? They were like, oh, really? I didn't know that. Maybe we should talk about that and get everyone on the same page. And it was just especially within that smaller organization, and I'm just focusing there for now, it can be a really great way of just bringing everyone together, say, we're all on the same page. And if there's anything, any other source of truth or any other frame of thinking, let's integrate it into this. Let's not have different views here. So the way that I typically like to do this, and this is actually a, a, a replica of something that I've written in this role for a whole team, is in a, a simple wiki page because it's easy for people to follow in a linear format. It's available to everyone. And at the time you get into a situation where you have a free 15 minutes, you can say, can I show you my strategy? And this is something that we highly advocate, just being annoying with your strategy and telling everyone the story that you can. But as you can see here, we have the vision, we have the goal, we have the playing field. There's three strategies that we got here, the insight strategy, the connect strategy, and the recommend strategy. That's how we're going to win in this market based upon the competitors that we've looked at. Here's the capabilities of things we're going to really be things we're going to need to get there. Maybe it's a, a new platform, a new tool. Maybe it's an additional team. We don't know. We'll, we'll, you'll have to figure that out. Then a short insight into the upcoming initiatives that will be 
addressing. I advocate highly that every product manager should have one of these ready. And the reason is that I actually had one of my product managers do this and he accidentally was in a call with the CEO one day. Apparently he was in a big call with a whole bunch of people. No one else turned up and it was just him and the CEO. And he said, hey, can I just show you my strategy now that we've got the time? He walked the CEO through it in about 20 minutes saying, this is where we're going. This is what customers and markets were prioritizing. These are the ways we're going to win, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the only question the CEO had at the end of it was, great, how can I help? And that's really what you're trying to aim for. We're building confidence and direction in people who necessarily aren't, may not be product people, but they want to know, look, you've got this covered. You've thought it through. You've used data. You've talked to the right people. And by talking to those people, as we'll talk about in a minute, you've actually built the strategy in that way. Actually, let's go straight into that. We advocate that you write this down, start today, get it down there, and just share it with your tribe. And this is the setting mechanism that we just have been somewhat talking about, is that if everyone has their own idea of where we're going and it's slightly different, it's a lot of drag on the whole team. But when you actually write this down and go, hey, my, hey, tribe, here's this, hey, designer, hey, engineer, this is where I think we're going. What do you guys think? And then you start thinking, okay, what about this? What about that? And it's really using that lean build, measure, learn loop to go, okay, cool. You, we all had slightly different ideas of direction. Now we're on the same page. Now share that with your product team. Hey, product team, this is where we're going with this part of the product. What do you guys think? Again, integrating all their thoughts, feedback. Doesn't mean you have to take on everyone's feedback, but you at least need to acknowledge or let them know, hey, no, that's not right. This is where we're going. Then share that with your peers. We shared this with our head of customer success, head of sales, head of engineering, Okay, are we all on the same page here? Okay, you guys understand? Do you have any questions? Okay, cool. Then by the time that you've actually got that to the executive level, notice how I have already walked that through the entire organization. They've given me that feedback and they've somewhat co-authored this strategy because they've given me, so actually we need to go a little bit left, a little bit right. By the time we actually share this with the executive, you're able to say, look, everyone knows about this. This is the direction we're going. I've incorporated all the feedback. It gives them immense confidence that you've not only just written the document, but you've aligned the team. And that's a huge part of it. Because that's the gap that people find if you write a strategy and say, okay, you're following this direction. Who else is following this direction? It's all about that influence. And you hear that in word a lot in product management, being able to influence. And this is a tool for creating that influence and aligning people in the right direction to reach the outcomes that you're looking for. Um, so we do have some important tenants when writing a document like this. And I've already hit upon a few of these, but as I said before, guiding the reader. So it's really important. And I don't know if we really talked about this before, but it's really important to have the vision and goal for the business because that's the, the uniting factor that every single person in the organization should be aligned under. And that's why if you don't have a vision or a set of clear business goals, everyone's going in their own direction where they think they should be going. So that is an important part. If you can find it, if not, acknowledge it with your leaders going, hey, we don't have a vision, we don't have goals, but we'll do our best to find a direction. But you really want to start, that, that's why we have this structure. You really want to write it in this way because everyone can start here and everyone can parachute down this into, okay, this is what you're doing here down in your team, but this is how it contributes to the direction that we're all working towards. So really important to guide the reader. Second is use simple language. Remove all engineering product jargon and slang. To create because you the whole point of this document has got to be as widely read and understood as possible. So I know there's going to be a limit to what you can do in some cases. Like you can't not abbreviate SQL. It's just what it is. People got to know what that means. But I've seen this a lot being guilty of talking about pain points and things like that. You don't have to use those words. You can actually use non-product terms to communicate your message. And I think the better strategy documents I've read have tried to appeal to more people in plain language. And the third most important thing is linked to sources. There's two major ways that a document doesn't become credible. And that's if you're the only person who supports it, but also it's not even acknowledged or used the rest of the data that's sitting around the business. So when you do have sources like competitive analysis or even board reports or things like that, which point you in a certain direction, just link to those to give the executive team and whoever's written confidence that you're not building alone. You're building layers on top of the rest of the business data out there. And it gives them immense amounts of confidence that you're making decisions using that data. You're not just making decisions from the hip. And this is where they all, I say this a lot in my career is that there's this perception from non-product people that most product managers are just shooting from the hip. They don't know how they're doing it. So being open with that and being saying, no, I'm making these decisions based on all the best data we have. And this is an important point. We're 
this may or may not be right, this product strategy, but we're doing it with the best data we have at this time. And that's why rewriting a product strategy regularly is important because new data will come up and you may find one strategy is not working. You might find that a, a better opportunities come up and you can uh, seize those. But at the end of the day, what I'm trying to say here is linking to that data creates a really strong message, which people can start trusting your document for. So what's next? We've talked through our framework. We've talked through some of the ways that we've learned to use it. And by sharing it widely, we're getting feedback now on a regular basis. When we talked earlier, we talked about, we went and did some research and talked all this through, validating that the problem that Simon and I were solving for ourselves was a problem that exists out in the world. And every time we have this conversation now, we hear over and over this repetitive, yes, we experience these pain points when we're trying to pull together a product strategy, when we're talking to executives, we're bumping up against language, we're bumping up against the way that we measure things. Like we're having these conversations and they just don't seem as fruitful as possible. So why did we go out and do that? One, because we're product people and we wanted to make sure that we were actually building something that was not just solving one problem, but actually was a repeated problem across more than one person. And when we started sharing it, we got this feedback. And what we did next was we actually wrote a book. And that book is available for all of you for free today. So if you want to grab a copy of the book to actually take the next step and actually take everything that we've talked about, and go through it. It takes about 45 minutes to read. It's super practical. The idea was every product strategy book I've ever read, and there's been a few of them, they're quite like fluffy. They're like, this is the way you should do it, but there's no practical, like these are the ways that you can dig into it. And we wanted to write something that was easy to consume that would give you the framework, but then allow you the flexibility to go and do it yourself, but provide enough guidance that you can sit down, read the book, start writing your strategy in 60 minutes and get out there and start sharing it with your team. And that's us. Yeah. I think I might just jump on just a little bit there. Yeah. We've read a lot of great product management books and there's so many out there, but the practicality part is so necessary. So this has always been about how do we get someone who doesn't have a strategy up and running within a relatively small amount of time. And uh, Ali and I have always been quite scrappy. Just get the first version out has always been the most important thing and then start to integrate and iterate on top of that. So we feel like this is a really great way to get started. But really appreciate. If you are going to download it, please just leave us a review. Five stars, hopefully, but it's really up to you. It really helps us share this message. And you can connect with us on LinkedIn or just send us an email if you have any questions. But we also, I believe we also have Q&A. Is that right, Scott? It is. We've got a few questions in here already. So hopefully people can grab okay, a copy okay. of the book. In the meantime, we'll jump in with the first question here from Richard. Do you think that the playing field is something that the executive team needs to also make choices about and that the product playing field choices are a subset of that? Great first question. Ali, do you want to jump on this or...? Should I come in after? I'll jump in. Correct. I feel like in my experience, there's a couple of things. A product strategy contributes to a business strategy. It doesn't exist in a silo. Depending on the shape of your organization, whether you're more product-led or more sales-led, your business strategy, if it's a sales-led business, you're more likely to have a really strong business strategy. If you're a product-led organization, your product strategy will be stronger and have more sway. So to answer that, it depends on the type of organization where that is going to sit in regards to importance and guidance. But what I would say is a product strategy is always going to be almost a fractal, like it's a spiral down one step from your business strategy. It doesn't have all of the components of a business strategy, but it feeds into all of the components of a business strategy. Um, And yes, I think executives should have a contribution there. But again, depending on the scale of your business, whether you're sales-led or product-led, there will be different influences that play out there. I don't know if that completely answers it, but that's how I look at it. Well, 
I completely agree. It's going to be very different if you're in a sales focus organization versus a product focused organization. And this is actually where some of the uh, friction, the virtuous friction can come from. Because if you're in a very sales led organization, and we actually experienced this, I think, Ali, you're in a very sales led organization where they prioritize one playing field, but the product doesn't can't really compete on that playing field. Or what we've been building has been going in a different direction. And then even also playing fields will pop up. People are like, oh, can we do this? No, we haven't built that product. And that's where it's actually important for product to have a voice. And if you don't have a CPO or any sort of a executive, that's a problem. But you as a product leader will still need to go into those conversations and have that voice about what playing fields to have at the executive level and match that against the playing fields the product's actually built to compete on. I hope that answers the question, but they should completely be involved. But at the end of the day, the product is the product. And you shouldn't be going after fields you can't compete on. So that's why the executive teams can't always decide we're going to go here if you can't actually compete there. Great point. Question from Diego. How many times have you had to communicate this vision to the different areas to generate alignment? And how many times did you defend it because people forgot the vision or goals? I know there's always the thing of you got to say this 10 or 12 or 15 times for that a lot in strategy. But yeah, maybe what are your thoughts on this? I, I think I'll jump in first. It's just I just don't stop. As far as I'm concerned, I'll tell you when you've had enough. When people say, when you say, "Hey, have you heard my strategy?" and people go, "Yeah, I'm good," <laughs> that's when it's I've got it, cool. But but that's actually the level of filling the cup that you want. Like you, 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 there's going to come a point where the cup's full, and you can go do other things. But until that's full, and until it's very, very painfully clear, and then you can almost repeat it in their sleep, you should continue to repeat it. And I don't know if the word is defend. I just slightly reframe that because a strategy without alignment is weak. And so you're not really defending your strategy, you're building your strategy. And it's only done through listening to people. And this is where the really soft skills of a PM is really important. The best product managers create alliances. And there's always going to be trade-offs to make. And you have to show that you care about what they want, not just what you want. So you're going to have to make some changes. There's a little bit of politicking involved, making that everyone's getting what they need. But I wouldn't be defending it. I would be building it in as much as I could. I'd be trying to build it and try to find win-wins for everyone across the organization. Yeah. Ali? Awesome. That was good. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you're saying that a little bit here. Reading one of the next questions. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like language that? barrier. Yeah, so yeah, language barrier piece. Yeah, that's here. I just, I, I, absolutely. There's going to be some problems because it's all about communication and alignment. So if that's a problem, that's always going to be a problem when different, Languages, which have words have different meanings, but at the end of the day, you can't not try. That's the point here. You can't not try because it's hard. It's actually one of the most important parts of a product manager's contribution is making good trade-off choices and making sure that everyone is influenced and, and buys into those. Yeah, I think even going back to your point earlier of the allies and relationships part, lean on the allies you've got and the relationships you have to help you overcome those hurdles. Put, put well, them in well, your the, court, the, basically. As your this advocate. is a super big point, Scott, which I I think we actually too much glossed over. The whole point of going to your triad and the whole point of going with slowly expanding that circle is there's an influence person. There's a, a smell test people always do and say, is this the first time anyone's read this? Or ha has everyone else? This is, I think if you've ever read Robert Cialdini's book, Influence, one of the things that people are influenced by is social proof. So when they see that all these people that they respect have read this and support it, they're much more, okay, okay cool. What you're talking about and be open to those conversations. And that's why we start with friendlies and we slowly expand that circle out to people you want to influence, which may or may not, they might be neutral, but at the end of the day, they trust that you've done the work. Yeah. Great point. Great point. Other question here, what techniques or templates do you use to help executives prioritize amongst the good ideas out there? As you mentioned, the ideas are likely in the right direction, but we need to choose where to place our bets. Ali, I think this is your, <laughs> your thing. Yeah. So confidence levels is how I like to think about it. So I'm going to go like fluffy and then I'll focus in. If you have an opportunity space, right, that underpins a strategy, but you've got a whole bunch of ideas in that, and that strategy has not been proven as in this is new to the business. It's a direction that's newer to us. And you haven't done any testing or you haven't shipped anything that's actually being used yet. If you're trading that off against something that's, we've delivered these features, we're getting huge value. We can see how that 
connects to our product metrics. We've run these experiments last quarter that tell us, unfortunately, that that strategy on the left-hand side doesn't have the weight and it will become a trade-off clearly because this, the one on the right is we've got all this data, we've got proof. It seems like a no brainer to go in this direction. And so to prioritize the left-hand side, you have to have executive really push and they may have a vision or if you're in a product led, it might be the CEO who founded the company and he's like, we need to do this because my future vision way out here requires it. And that's going to be where the input is put in. If you're in a larger organization where there's more structure in place already, that trade-off conversation is going to be difficult because I would say I would probably prioritize the one with the data behind it. And so what I would say is, what's the experiment that you're going to propose that's going to prove this is the right direction to go? What research are you going to undertake to show me that this piece of work should be prioritized over this? And that's the thinking at a product level you need to get used to doing is going, if I can't support this with data, I'm going to struggle. Okay, I'm not going to get executive buy-in because there's way more proof over here. What can I do to prove that this is the right direction? What's the step I can take? So that will then allow you to prioritize. So then let's talk about the prioritization framework. Look, to be honest, there's a million of them. I usually use value to effort. I'm in a medium size where a hundred people, like I know everybody in my team, We've got a clear strategy and roadmap, both for business and product. The trade-off conversations that I have are the velocity of my team versus the value that I can ship. So value to effort. And that's literally what I'm trading off against. When you have more complex stakeholder relationships you need to manage, something like rice is like a go-to, but it can just be getting everyone in a room and having a conversation. And using something like Rice to have that conversation. I think prioritization frameworks can misguide. It can provide you a, a stack rank, but it's not actually going to make the decision for you. And so if you don't have the right people in the room to have the conversation with that stack rank, you're going to shoot you. It just doesn't work. What happens is you prioritize something and an executive comes in and goes, why wasn't I asked about this? And so the key here is get your stakeholders in a room, have a good conversation, talk through the stack rank that helps you understand how these things bubble up to the top, but do the conversation. Don't shy away from the conversation. That's how I answer that one. <laughs> That's good. And I'm going to just agree on that one as well. We'll jump into the next question. <laughs> yep. How do you handle or structure your playing field when you have multiple customers that you're trying to serve? So this is that sort of messy part of, obviously, we're trying to play everywhere, not maybe focused on a particular segment or audience, but uh, yeah. How do you deal with that? How do you essentially ensure you're making that right choice and trickling that down to the right levels? I'm struggling with the question just a little bit because we talk about, do you simply write out just one primary customer and run another? It's not really about customers, it's about areas. So you have to figure out, and this may be apparent to some people, are we actually going for the EU market or not? Because there may be certain things, and we're going through this right now as accounting practice software, there's specific regulations and specific things we need to cater for in that region to really even play on that field. And then you may be considering, are we going for enterprise or are we going for SMB? And as enterprise has a whole different sales cycle, it has, I can see Scott nodding, a whole different sales cycle, a whole different group of stakeholders, you need a whole set of features, which they probably need. Security being one of them, single sign-on, all those kinds of things. So it's really about understanding what areas you're going after based upon their particular needs. Back to your question. Yes, that primary customer may have particular, more particular needs than the secondary customer. I don't know how, how you separate those, but you've really got to understand what groups and types of customers you're going after. And this is because of the compound effect. That's where it really hits. Because if you're likely to appeal to a customer who has a, a shape, a, a location, et cetera, you're probably going to appeal to another customer who looks a lot like that. And this is where your competitive analysis comes into it. Your TAM, like how big, how many of these people are, how many of these organizations are there in this region? How many of these can we actually get away from a competitor? If they're the big gorilla and they are the all singing, all dancing complex product, if we come in as a simple product, how much of that market do you think we can actually serve and obtain? 
So I think you need to think about it in areas like that, but you really typically want to think about slicing by value. As I said, are you the cheapest option or the most expensive option? Design of usability. Are you going to be the easy thing to use or are you going to be the hard thing to use, the pro tools? And then you've got to think about region as well. Are you going to play just the US? Are you going to play global? Because there's plenty of organizations which have just left the US and said, we're going to play in the rest of the world because there's enough of a pie to eat there. And we'll leave that organization, the king, to sit and take the US market. I'll, and the weird thing is a lot of these prioritization conversations have not happened at the executive level. Sometimes it's just sell to whoever you can, but that starts to really drain and drag on the product team, as I said, when you're pulled in so many different directions. Ali? Yeah, what I would add is, I don't, I can't tell clearly, but I, I feel like maybe it's a marketplace conversation. And if you've got a playing field where you've got a two-sided marketplace or multi-sided marketplace, that also changes. You're still in the same market, but you should understand who's your rescuer. So who do you need at that point in time in your business? Is it the one providing the product, the value, or is it the person buying the value? And you need to then prioritize which features are going to get more of which one you need at that point in time onto your platform. So I don't know, I just read into that a little bit, that it might be about a two-sided marketplace. Everything else I agree with. Them. Well, that's awesome. I know we're running out of time here, almost at the top of the hour. I'm just going to wrap things up for the day, but thank you both. This was like super insightful. I really appreciate you extending the opportunity too for people to get a hold of a copy of this book and use it as a resource in their product practice. Hopefully we can get a few people back. We'll be talking about how they've applied it at some point down the road. That'd be really lovely to hear. That'd be awesome. Uh, best stories and stuff like that. And uh, yeah, I'm sure it'll be very valuable for a lot of people in terms of the work they're doing. With that... I have shared a link in the chat for our post-event survey. If you have a moment to do that, please do. We'd love to have both the qualitative and the quantitative feedback that we can share with these two folks that took the time out of their lives to put this together. And if we didn't get your chance to get to your question today or something comes up afterwards, let us know. You can pop that in the Slack community and definitely we'll be there to, uh, to answer and make it available. And if you want to speak or get involved in one of our events like Simon and Alejandro did, feel free to put up your hand and let us know. We'd always like to have other people talking about their craft, their decisions, those tough product choices that we all have to make every day as part of the work that we do. We've got a lot of things going on in the community, events and different programs and meetups and things like that that are starting. Next week, we're talking to Ryan Vandermeer about OKRs. And then Michael Hauser is finishing up our July events. We'll be taking a break over August, coming back with a really busy slate of stuff over September and October. And with that, thank you everybody for joining us. And thank you again, guys, for taking the time out of your busy days and early mornings. I hope you get a chance to get some coffee now. And uh, thanks again, everybody, for taking the time out to enjoy. See you later. Thank you. Take care. Thank you.